welcome hook to our discussion of the Old West. And in this lecture, we'll be looking at Texas in the roughly 25 years from the end of Reconstruction in 1877 until 1900. I'd like first to look at the experience of the indigenous people or the Indians in Texas in the 25 years um, after Reconstruction. Looking at the United States as a whole for a moment, in 1851, the United States government signed the Fort Laramie Treaty, which guaranteed Indians refuge west of the Mississippi River into the area that was then known as the Great American Desert. And this applied to the Indians east of the Mississippi River, who had either voluntarily or involuntarily been moved west of the Mississippi River. It also applied to the Indians, the many, many different Indian groups that were living west of the Mississippi River. It was called the Great American Desert because it was believed that the area was really of no use for farming. The soils west of the Mississippi River are very, very tough um, in places like Kansas, that are now Kansas and Nebraska. And the steel plows, excuse me, the iron plows that they had at the time would break trying to cut the uh, soil. It was only in the 1870s and 1880s when steel plows were developed, that the much tougher steel blade could cut through the soil. And of course, that area today is one of the most productive agricultural areas in the world. Now, the Indians were given land, all the land west of the Mississippi River, for, quote, as long as waters run and the grass shall grow. In other words, forever. And it's estimated there were around a quarter of a million or 250,000 Indians um, west of the Mississippi River. Many had been forced from east of the Mississippi River. Not all Indians had been forced from the area east of the Mississippi River. There were quite a number living um, in small communities. But in some areas, as you've studied previously, for instance, in the southeast, in the around Georgia in the 1830s in the uh, removal of the Cherokee and some other tribes in that area in the so-called uh, Trail of Tears. <clears throat> now this, these, these three maps show, I think, a really very clear way what happened to the Indian land. The first map in the upper left-hand corner is 1850. And you can see the land in black is land either held by the Indians or returned to the Indians. So you can see in 1850, you have all of California, virtually the entire uh, west of the United States, except for some area in Colorado where silver had been discovered and the Indians were pushed out. And in Texas, which of course is the subject of this course, you can see uh, much of West Texas was in the hands of Indians. Now, if we jump forward only 15 years to 1865, at the end of the Civil War, you don't see really any significant difference in the state of Texas, but you do see it along the West Coast. Of course, gold was discovered in 1848 in California, leading to the 1849 gold rush. And you had many, many settlers who went to California. And the Indians were occupying very fertile land, and they were pushed off that land. Same thing in the Pacific Northwest, states of Oregon and Washington. Now we'll move forward 15, another 15 years from 1865 to 1880. And what a difference. There are very, very few areas where the Indians hold the land. You see in the Southwest, there's some, 
in Arizona, New Mexico area, uh, very arid area, not, not good for farming. And they've been essentially pull, pushed out of most of Texas, except the area, in the very western part of the state, where you can see sort of near El Paso and the Big Bend area where the Rio Grande has a big bend. <clears throat> now, from the Civil War until 1900, Americans repeatedly violated these treaty provisions. And you will recall the United States government entered into a treaty with the Indians because the Indians were not considered American citizens, but rather um, citizens of their tribal nations. And so it was a treaty relationship. So they had the buffalo hunters. We'll look at those briefly. You had many miners, not so much in Texas. The miners were more in Colorado, um, some of the northwestern part of the United States, um, and California, of course. Ranchers, which we'll look at in a minute. Farmers, railroads, and soldiers. And the railroads were given large tracts of land to encourage them to build their railroads since the federal government owned the entire western part of the United States to encourage railroads, they, the railroads would be given <coughs> the right-of-way and the, the area for the track, and usually a huge area, 10 to 20 miles on both sides of the track, and that area would belong to the railroads. They could then sell that um, because once they built a railroad, people would be eager to move in and uh, establish farms or, or towns. Also, the railroads were given the mineral rights to that huge area of, of land. <clears throat> now, we'll see U.S. Army General Sheridan uh, in a few minutes for, for much of the effort to remove the Indians um, and push them into reservations. He was in charge of this effort. He was very, very ruthless. But in his later years, he made this statement. And again, this is from General Sheridan. Quote, we took away their country. He's referring to the Indians. We took away their country and their means of support, broke up their mode of living, their habits of life, introduced disease and decay among them. And it was for this and against this that they made war. Could anyone expect less? And again, this was from the general in the U.S. Army who led the effort um, to push the Indians off lands wanted by the white men and into reservations. <clears throat> now, this is an overview map of the Indian Wars, um, I use this in my general U.S. history course, and you can see that in Texas, the major effort by the U.S. Army was against the Comanches. The, also, the Apaches were in southern New Mexico, and there were some, obviously, in Texas. <clears throat> the Indians were forced onto reservations. These were areas set aside by the federal government, and they were for the exclusive use of the Indians. They were generally in the least desirable places where often in Arizona or New Mexico, the land was very, very arid. It was almost desert. And, you know, could you imagine they pushed an Indian tribe in there that was used to riding horses and getting its meat and clothing from killing buffalo, and all of a sudden they're put on an Indian reservation without horses, without buffalo, and told to farm the very dry land. Or Indians who'd been in uh, a heavily forest area, forested area might be there. There were some reservations, uh, for instance, in the state of Oklahoma, where there was much better land. And those who refused to move voluntarily were attacked by the U.S. Army. Faced with attacks, many, many Indians uh, moved onto the reservations. I don't think we could really say voluntarily because if they didn't move, 
um, they would have been forced to move. Now, once they were on the reservations, the goal was Americanization, to turn these Indians into good American citizens. And you may recall from your earlier studies, this was in line with Thomas Jefferson's belief, and most Americans after the Civil War subscribed to this belief that the American Indians were not biologically inferior to whites, rather they were culturally inferior to whites or culturally backward was the phrase used. And all they needed was education. They, they needed to forget their quote superstitions and become Christians. They needed to adopt Western dress and not dress in deer skins or buffalo robes, but dress in suits, not suits, but shirts and pants and proper Anglo shoes, go to school, adopt American names, Christian names. American names were, were Christian names. It had to be the name of a saint. So all the Indians were taught in school to to change their names and choose from a list of saints and in a uh, Christian name. And Americans felt that having done this, the Indians would be culturally equivalent to, um, to whites. And of course, at this time, the vast majority of Americans believed what Thomas Jefferson had thought about the the blacks in the United States, that they were biologically inferior and no amount of education could improve their lot. Now this is a really dramatic photo, a set of photos. These are the same three boys. Hard to believe. Look at them on the left. They're dressed in uh, animal skins, um, you can see they have long hair. The, the boys had what we call today a, a ponytail. They would sit on the floor or on a stack of blankets. And the picture on the right is, was taken a few months later um, of the same three boys. You can see the two in the front are sitting in proper chairs. They're wearing Western style clothing and you immediately see of course how their their hair has been cut and by the way the boys sitting there on the left those aren't feathers coming out of the top of his head that's the um the wallpaper it's a plant drawn on the wallpaper so what a difference between the two and americans <clears throat> would see these photos and particularly in the protestant churches in the east where people would give money in the church to send missionaries out to Christianize the Indians. And they'd be very proud. They'd see this and they'd say, wow, my money is well spent. These, quote, savages have been turned into good Americans, good Christians. They're wearing, their hair is cut. They're wearing proper clothes, et cetera, et cetera. And this was a very popular effort by the Christian churches. <clears throat> now in Canvas, there's a three or four minute video <clears throat> on this very topic. It's a dramatization of a white woman who's come from a church in the West, in the East, and she's there to teach them, you know, basically as their teacher. But what you see in this video is she's asking the students to choose to change their name and choose a good Christian name. And you can see the woman, I mean, I'm sure she believed that she was doing the very best. She left probably a very comfortable house and, you know, she was middle class and had gone down to work on the reservation. And this two or three minute video is one of my favorites because it gets across this whole process. And again, at the time, people thought that they were making, this was positive for the Indians. Of course, it was 
removing their entire culture and heritage. <clears throat> now let's zoom forward quickly to today. Um, in the United States today, there are around 3 million people who identify as Native Americans or Indians, and they don't find it offensive to be called Indians. They don't find that word offensive. Most of them live in the West. Um, the Indians only became U.S. citizens in 1924 by an act of Congress because before that they were considered residents of foreign nations. Well, not foreign nations, but independent nations. In other words, the tribes. And therefore, they weren't subject to state law. And the treaties were between the Indians and the federal government. Now, <clears throat> you recall that the 14th Amendment passed shortly after the Civil War <clears throat> had made everybody residing in the U.S. or born in the United States an American citizen. This did not apply to the Indians because there's a clause in the 14th Amendment that refers to people subject to U.S. jurisdiction. And so the exceptions there at the time the 14th Amendment was passed were the American Indians. They knew that when they were writing the 14th Amendment. They didn't want to give citizenship to U.S. to Indians because they were living in Indian nations. Now today, roughly one-third the Indians United States voluntarily live on the reservations. They're, of course, no longer required to live there. And the other two-thirds generally live in large cities. Many, many of them are um, in California near um, Los Angeles or in large cities in Arizona and New Mexico, also some in Colorado. <clears throat> the reservations <clears throat> were set up under f federal treaty, and so the it's called the tribal area. The Indians on that reservation have their own police force and their own courts. The state is not allowed, the state police are not allowed to go on that reservation, and state law does not apply on that Indian reservation. Well, in most states, it's illegal to have gambling with casinos, and some Indians have taken advantage of that. And on their reservations, they have set up casinos with gambling. And of course, people come from outside the reservation and they can gamble there where they can't in their state. And some of the Indian tribes have done a great marketing job on this and actually made quite a bit of money. Now, under the terms of the treaties with the federal government, the federal government can intervene with federal agents if a crime is committed for which the sentence would be more than one year. Uh, these are very, very serious crimes, you know, such as murder. Uh, and then the federal government gets involved by federal agents uh, helping the Indian police. <clears throat> this is a map showing in blue the Indian reservations in 1890. At a glance, you can see right north of Texas, the Indian Territory. Um, that's now the state of Oklahoma. And to this day, Oklahoma has a high percentage of its Indian, of its population that are of Native American heritage. Uh, you can see some of the other reservations in the Southwest. And the map has also the names of the tribes, like in sort of Arizona, New Mexico area, you have Apaches and Navajos and the Hope Indians, and then some up in the, the northern part, northwestern part of the United States. Again, this is a map as of um, 1890. <coughs> Sorry. Now, in Texas today, there are three federally recognized Indian reservations. Um and I have a map in the next slide. And the first one is the Alabama Coshota, which is about an hour and a half or two hours uh, northwest of Houston. Uh, you can drive up there, um, just drive into the reservation. The last time I went, I, they told me they had no one living there, but they had a nice lake and they'd 
they had beautiful cabins there they'd rent out uh, on the lake. And I talked to some of the Indians working there and they said, oh, they all live in the local town. It's pretty near Livingston. Um, but as you drive in, there's a big sign saying, you are leaving now the jurisdiction of the state of Texas and entering the tribal lands of the Alabama Coshata Indian Nation and subject to their police force, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and the two others are the Tiguas in West Texas and the Kikapu uh, in, down near Laredo on the Mexican border. In addition to those three federally recognized Indian reservations, the um, state has recognized the Lip, Lipan Apache tribe of Texas, which has its headquarters in McAllen. Now, you'll recall from our earlier studies of Texas Indians, there were quite a number of other uh, tribes or nations. And the three of the largest, the Caddo, the Comanche, and the Tonkawa, they have their um, headquarters in the state of Oklahoma today. This is the slide I promised to show you. <clears throat> this is, of course, a map of present-day uh, Texas, and you can see the Alabama Coshata just to the northwest of Houston, and it says underneath they're hoping to keep their casino open near Livingston. Um, last time I was there, they didn't have a casino, but they were trying to reopen it um, with the idea people would come in from nearby areas to gamble. Uh, down on the Mexican border, just a little northwest of Laredo, you have the Kickapoo. And there they do have a uh, casino. I think the only problem in a business sense for them is there's not next to a major um, population center. And then in far west Texas, they have the Tiguas. And they're, um, they're near El Paso. Okay, focusing a little more now just on Texas. Well, once the Civil War was over, U.S. Army troops returned again to the so-called frontier in Texas. This is sort of the area beyond uh, San Antonio, Austin, Waco, to the northwest there. And this was the area where Whites were had been complaining before the Civil War of Indian raids, and the army began negotiations and treaties with the Indians in the area. Well, it broke down, and there were battles, particularly with the Comanches and the Kiowas. Um, and, you know, the U.S. Army tried to put them into reservations, and they said, no, well, we don't want to be in a reservation because... Our way of life involves hunting the buffalo, and there aren't any buffalo here. Well, President Grant sought peace. He really, really uh, personally admired the Indians, and he had noticed that in the eastern part of the United States, the Quakers, members of the Quaker religion in Pennsylvania, had very good relationships with nearby Indians. So he appointed a Quaker gentleman to be the Indian agent um, in Texas. However, um, he was less than successful. <clears throat> well, starting in the 1870s, um, hunters, commercial hunters went out and almost exterminated all the herds of buffalo. They would go out with very large buffalo, we call, what we call buffalo guns, very powerful, and um, they don't. They would shoot the lead or the head buffalo, and that would disorganize the other buffaloes, and then they just shoot them. And of course, there were many, many millions of them. They were doing this not so much for sport; they were doing it because they could make good money by selling the buffalo hides, which were used for clothing instead of leather as well as the, the hides, after being processed, were cut into, into long strips. And this was just the beginning of the second Industrial Revolution with many factories. 
and they needed strong uh, belts to connect various machines together. Nowadays, we use rubber. Well, I don't think we use real rubber anymore in cars. We have some kind of synthetic rubber. If you open the hood of your car, you see all kinds of belts in the engine. Well, this wasn't for cars at that time. Obviously, there weren't cars. This was for big factories um, in the East. And the buffalo hide or leather is so tough. It, it was much better than using any other material available because they didn't have available the many materials we have today. So they would cut that up and they could make a lot of money. Then after removing the skin, the buffaloes would be left there. And a year or so later, um, all that would be left would be their skeletons. And those bones were often connect, uh, collected, ground up uh, into calcium for medicines and also um, other uh, material be made out of the bones. Now, in some areas, um, a little further north, not in Texas, but further north where they had trains, um, people would go out for sport and the, the train would stop in the middle of a big buffalo herd. <clears throat> the windows would be lowered and the men would just shoot rifles to kill as many as possible and just leave them there to rot. Um, obviously that, you know, killed many, many buffaloes. So the buffaloes were almost on the point of um, extinction, what today we'd call extinction. There were some buffaloes left on private property, private lands, and on um, some other areas. And of course the buffaloes have come back now and um, they're not roaming around by the millions like they used to. But in fact, you can go to many restaurants and instead of a hamburger, you get a, a buffalo burger. Um, and many people prefer to eat that because apparently it's lower in saturated fat, I think. Okay. Well, the net result was well over 3 million buffalo were killed and many, many of those in Texas. And that, you know, from sport or for selling their hides or the, the ground up bones. And that just devastated the Plains Indians because their way of life depended on the buffalo. They consumed the buffalo meat. Um, they didn't eat it fresh. You know, they cook, cooked it, obviously. They would smoke it and it would last a long time. It's like beef jerky today. You can go in almost any store and buy beef jerky. You know, beef, I guess you call it buffalo jerky. Um, they didn't call it that, but it would be the same principle. And they used the hides for clothing, for tents, whatever. And so that had a very negative impact on the Plains Indians. And it also freed up the Plains for cattle ranching because the buffalo, there were so many buffalo there, you couldn't really raise cattle. But once the buffalo were virtually uh, exterminated, it opened up that area for cattle ranching. And in fact, Army General Sheridan, um, you know, told the Texas legislature and many of them protested. He said, well, actually, it's a good idea just to kill all the bison or buffalo. And that will settle the Indian question because the Indians will have to leave the plains and then we can push them on to the reservations. Uh, this, of course, is the same General Sheridan I quoted a few minutes ago because later in his life, uh, he very, very much regretted everything he had done. <clears throat> so at this point, uh, particularly in Texas, well, well, the whole center of the United States, the Great Plains, the Buffalo are essentially gone. And the Plains Indians who depended on the Buffalo, that was part of their way of life, had moved out either voluntarily or involuntarily. And that opened up that whole area to cattle ranching. Uh, now, when the Spanish arrived, and of course, the Spanish are the, brought not only the horse, but they brought cattle to the Western Hemisphere. They uh, practiced open range ranching in northern Mexico and what's now Texas. And open range means, just as it suggests, the cattle go out and just wander around the natural grasses and eat 
and you know and they do this near water sources such as rivers or small lakes and that really was very limited in the early 1800s but now in the late 1800s there's a lot more population growth in the US which means there's a lot more demand for beef <clears throat> and at that time virtually all white men and women would have beef at every meal that you know they didn't have Kellogg's cornflakes or you know waffle or something or croissant for breakfast i mean you know men would have a beef steak or sausages made of beef or you know same thing for lunch same thing for dinner so a tremendous amount of beef consumption and then there they came up with a way to market the the beef from the cattle to sell it in the population areas because there really wasn't enough population in Texas to sustain major ranches so they needed to get either the the cattle or the beef to areas uh, to sell the cattle. And this all occurred after the Civil War. <clears throat> and I'll talk more detail about that in a moment. So they had open range, unbranded cattle. Uh, you're probably familiar with the phrase branded. Branded is when a rancher has his cowboys take a hot piece of iron with the brand or the insignia of the ranch and they tie the the cow down and they they put the bright uh brand into the thick skin of the cow uh and that's permanent and that way the cow can wander freely and the cowboys just go out and find cattle with that brand and they know that's theirs because they all pretty much look the same. But during the Civil War, <clears throat> um, you know, there was really a, no access to the markets because just north of Texas, you know, you had the Union soldiers coming down. But after the Civil War, that changed and they could now move the cattle. Well, so what they wanted to do was move the cattle from Texas up to the north. The problem is they didn't have a railroad that went to Texas. So the question is how to get the cattle to the railroads. Well, that was done by cattle drives by cowboys. And we'll talk about that here for a few minutes. In this slide, uh, let's focus on the Texas area. You can see the red lines going in a northerly direction those were the lines used for the cowboys to drive the cattle up to the state of Kansas or you know that area where there were railroads and so they would get on their horses and we'll talk about this in a minute you know 15 20 cowboys with 3 or 4000 cattle and they would all walk up uh you know, several, about five, six hundred miles up to the railroad. That was obviously quite an adventure. It took many months. And those are the famous cattle drives, uh, the famous ones in the West. They all essentially started in Texas and they moved up. You, these are the four main trails shown in red. The one on the left or on the West was not to send the cattle on railroads to the East, but rather um, for people to buy the cattle, particularly up in the, what says Colorado Territory. Colorado wasn't a state there. And there were a lot of, of miners there because they they found a lot of silver and they were eager to buy the meat. Uh, and then you have the other three trails going up. And the destination is are places like Abilene, Dodge City. And those were uh, railroad stations where the cattle would be put on the, uh, in railroad cars, still alive, and it would be taken east. And you can see all this goes to the city of Chicago, there at the southern part of Lake Michigan. And in Chicago, they had huge, huge meat processing plants where the cows would arrive um, alive, 
on their four feet and they would be slaughtered and processed into meat in Chicago. And then that meat would be sent on. <clears throat> so what you see here is the 1860s, uh, 1870s. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is another slide uh, showing essentially the same thing, uh, focusing more on the cattle trails. You can see the same four cattle trails leading north. And um, the one on the on the right or the eastern side, um, people objected to the Texas cattle coming up because some of them had what was called cattle fever, some sort of disease, and they didn't want their diseased cattle going up. So uh, the Chisholm Trail was the most famous, the one next to the right, and that went up near San Antonio and straight up, and it went up to Abilene, Kansas. Um, another trail left from Bandera, Texas, which if you ever visit it, it's just outside San Antonio. I mean, well, not just outside, maybe a half hour, 45 minute drive from San Antonio. And it's called the Cowboy Capital of Texas. And they do a lot of tourism there now. So if you're ever in San Antonio uh, or you're there for a long weekend, you could go there. And they have all kinds of places where you can go and... Uh, you don't actually drive cattle, but, you know, you can stay on so-called dude ranches and, you know, you eat, you know, get up in the morning and you have a campfire like the cowboys did. I mean, you live in a nice little tent with a shower and everything. It's quite nice. And then you get, a, and then you can do, if you want to, you can go out with the cowboys on a, a day's ride. I did that once in my, and I was so sore from sitting on a horse because I don't ride horses every day, obviously. <laughs> and my legs and everything were not tired. But a lot of people do that. A lot of people from around the world go to Bandera because they have a great, great marketing uh, program. Particularly Europeans go there. And that's the image of Texas. And then on the far left or the east, you see leaving from Fort Concho, uh, the main trail goes up to Colorado. So this is before the railroad comes into Texas. Now, obviously, when the railroad comes into Texas, they don't have to do these uh, cattle drives. <clears throat> well, this is a real major, it's a heroic myth of Texas. It's not really a myth, it, it occurred. But many, many people think of Texas, they think of cowboys uh, driving cattle. It, it, it did take place. It took place for about 20 years. Um, and, you know, it's the subject of many, many movies. And, um, and this, the culture, the life of the cowboys um, going with the cows for months on end, which I think would rather be rather boring. But, um, you know, you watch the movies and they're fighting off Indians or, you know, they're chasing cows that run off or, you know, or whatever. Um, and also, before movies, many books on this were very popular in the eastern part of the United States and throughout the U.S. And it's sort of the Texas stereotype of which Texans uh, remain proud to this day of individualism. Here you have fewer than a dozen cowboys with thousands of cows headed north. Uh, the perseverance, obviously they had to get up every day and do this. And if it rained, they kept going. I mean, you know, whatever happened. And they overcame very, very harsh environments. Um, and, you know, there was occasionally violence on the frontier. And this is a real stereotype of uh, Texas. And a good number of Texans um, are very proud of that. It's uh, This is from an early, early postcard that you, that if you visited Texas 120, 30 years ago, you could buy this. I mean, they, 120 years ago, they didn't have cattle drives anymore, but you'd send this back to your family in New York or somewhere and say, well, here I am in Texas. And you see, you know, the really tough cowboys taking the cattle through a river. Uh, that must have been quite harsh to do. And they're um, on the trail for months at a time. Well, 
this all changed in the 1880s with when the new train lines came to Texas. So if you raised cattle, you, you didn't want to pay 15, 20 cowboys money uh, to drive your cattle for months and months up to a railroad in Kansas, during which time not only are you paying the cowboys, but um, you know some of the cattle died uh, from attacks by you know wolves or whatnot, or they just died from you know overexertion. And also they lost a lot of weight. That's a long way to walk. And the cowboys, of course, were on horses, but the, the cows were walking. And if you're raising beef, you want to have your cows as fat as possible. Also, at the same time, they started building meat processing plants in the Fort Worth area. And in fact, if you go to Fort Worth now, they... Uh, they have a real touristy site called this, I think it's called the Stockyards, where you can go and they actually, a couple times a day, they let longhorn cattle loose on the street and they have, uh, you know, cowboys who come running up on their horse and lasso them. And they, they have stockyards because people would drive the cattle up into Fort Worth from neighbor ranches up to 100 miles away. There, the cattle would be held and then most of it would be killed there in Fort Worth in one of the slaughterhouses. And then a great technological advancement was when they came up with refrigerated railroad cars. We don't think twice about them now, but these were entire railroad cars that had um, refrigeration. So once the meat was processed in Fort Worth, that fresh meat could be kept um, fresh for days on end and shipped from Fort Worth uh, to the east. And the same with, you know, for meat processed in Chicago or other places, it could be delivered to large eastern cities uh, fresh. So this led, these were technological advances that really helped the cattle industry, um, the railroads, and of course the refrigerated railroad cars. <clears throat> this map shows the extent of the transcontinental railroads in the 1880s. You will recall that the very first transcontinental railroad was finished in 1869, a few years after the Civil War. And that's the one on this map that goes from San Francisco to Sacramento and California, the Central Pacific, and then it connects in uh, Utah to the Union Pacific, it goes over. Well, only 15 years after that, you have several other railroads going across the entire United States. And for Texas, you had one that went from New Orleans to Houston, San Antonio to El Paso, and another one a little north of that that tied into the, all the other networks that went from Vicksburg, Mississippi, across Louisiana, Fort Worth, El Paso, etc. And obviously, there are many, many stations on these railroads. This map just shows the major cities. And then going north from Houston, you could take a small railroad line and get up to Fort Worth, and then you get the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad, and that takes you up to Chicago. So the railroads were of great importance, and you can see just 15 years uh, after the end of the Civil War, the country, the western part of the country, is connected by railroad. I think what's very interesting for us today, <clears throat> you see many, many photographs from this period of time of railroads with black smoke coming out, or you'll see factories with black smoke. And this was viewed very positively at the time, and it was modernity, the industrial age. This is a photograph of a, this is not in Texas, but this is, you could have seen this in Texas. People would have seen photographs like this and they'd be so proud. And you know, a good part of the photograph consists of black smoke coming out. And for people that meant it was powerful. Um, it's a bit like now for some people, some men, you know, they like a motorbike that's as noisy as possible. And, you know, uh, 
People take mufflers off their cars to have that, you know, deep sound of power. Um, but this is, you know, smoke. Nobody worried about pollution then. And so this was very, very um, powerful. And by the way, along this railroad line, you can see on the right, the telegraph lines that we talked about earlier. And just interesting, this was just not in the United States. <clears throat> in Europe, um, I'm sure you've heard of the famous French Impressionist painting, painter, rather, Claude Monet. Uh, this is one of his favorite, famous paintings. And you can see the railroad there with black smoke coming up. And for the French people, that was wonderful because that symbolized the modern age that the French had, you know, powerful locomotives. The more smoke, the better. Some more paintings um, by Monet and another one was Manet. And these were railroad stations in Paris and people looking at this, these paintings would just beam with pride. Look at here in, in Paris, look at these all that smoke coming out. It's, you know, we are very modern. And here's another one also. Okay. <clears throat> now, the importance of the cattle industry, excuse me, the cattle industry led to the establishment of very large ranches. Um, the first ones appeared in the northern part of the state in the so-called panhandle. And a few of those had over 1 million acres, tremendous amount of acreage, with about 100,000 cattle on each. Now, if you've ever driven in that area of the, state, of the state, you wonder where the cattle would drink. I mean, there are some rivers, but they're not many. There are not many lakes. It's certainly not like East Texas. Well, that whole area of North Texas has a lot of water located underground. And so you could... You wouldn't have to dig down very far um, to pump the water up. Now, nowadays, it's largely done by electric pumps. But in the time period we're talking about, there, there were really no electric pumps on farms. So what people used were small windmills that, were, um, that would pull the water up and there'd be a big basin there for the cattle to drink. And you can see many of these today when you drive around, you know, encourage you to get off the big roads, drive on the little roads. And, you know, you can look and often near the roads, I'll show you what these look like. They look like this, and this is one. And it pumps up the water, slow, you know, it's windy there. And the water, this just has a, the wind turns and it makes that white thing at the bottom go up and down which is some kind of pump. And not on this, but on others, you can see water sort of comes out in little squirts into what looks like a huge bathtub made of tin, and the cattle go there and drink. And since it's windy much of the time, it works perfectly, and it requires no electricity. <clears throat> Speaking of rainfall, this is... Um, a map showing the precipitation in the United States. The dark green means heavy precipitation. Um, it's you know 40 to 60 inches a year. And you can see that on the east coast of the United States there, clearly, right? And the southern part of the United States. The purple color means even more rain, and that's down in the Gulf Coast. And you can see in Texas, which we're studying now, you have that heavy rain in East Texas, and Houston's in that area, and there was a lot of corn, cotton, sheep grazing, and rice on the coast. And cotton went over a bit more. We have the lighter green, which is 20 to 40 inches a year. <clears throat> um, you can see, but then that's, that's perfect for beef cattle, and I've circled in red that whole area, and that extends uh, north. And then the line that runs from Mexico to Canada, the, the big green line, was what they called the division with the Great American Desert. Um, and um, actually, earlier they drew that line right at the Mississippi River because they didn't have advanced agricultural techniques. But you can see sort of 
West Texas all the way to California is very, very dry, very arid. And of course, in the middle there, you have the Rocky Mountain Range. And then you have in California, it's not labeled on this map, the uh, Sierra Nevada. <clears throat> well, there was a lot of money to be made or the prospect of a lot of money. So many Northerners, as well as foreigners, wanted to invest in large Texas cattle ranches by 1900. And so at first it started in northern Texas, in the Panhandle area, and then there was a lot down in south Texas. And by far the most famous um, ranch in Texas is the King Ranch um, down in south Texas, south of the Nueces River. Uh, you could go visit it today. It's huge. They use helicopters. Um, well, they have some cowboys, you know, on, on horses, but... Uh, when I was there, they were explaining how they use these helicopters and they come low and the, the cattle just move. Um, yeah, it's not it's not the romantic image of a cowboy, you know, flying a helicopter to push the cows around. But <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so the ranches were expanding and expanding. And as people bought land and they wanted to keep the cow on their land and particularly sources of water if they had a river or a lake. So people at first started putting up fences made of wood. Well, wood fences are very expensive and in, in many areas where they're cattle, there's simply no nearby source of wood because the open range meant, you know, the horse, the cattle could go anywhere. Also, there were environmental issues with more and more cattle because the issue was who had access to the water and also the soil would erode if the cattle um, ate too much of the grasses. <clears throat> so the fencing and later they used barbed wire and I have a photo on the next slide. Barbed wire in case you haven't seen it is wire with little sharp points about every six or seven inches and the cows will will hit that, it doesn't really hurt them, but they don't like the sensation, they move away. And that um, that protected the owner's cattle on the larger f farms. The small cattle rage raisers would be on public lands and they were sort of pushed off. And there were sometimes battles over these fences and the wire because uh, people Ranchers who didn't have access to a lot of water would try and use cowboys to drive their cattle to water. And oh my God, they come across a barbed wire fence put up by a, a neighboring uh, rancher and they had no access. So this is barbed wire. It's a very, very simple concept. Uh, they twist this piece of wire around uh, two other wires and it has pointy ends. And then they put they twist the other wire so the, the barbs don't move. It's very, very inexpensive to make and particularly compared to wooden fences. All you have to do is put up some poles and stretch this out. And of course, people would try and cut it. And so um, the Texas legislature made it a felony, a serious crime, if you were caught uh, cutting someone else's barbed wire fence. So the open trail drives ended by the railroad, the barbed wire, the large private ranches. And now the, the, they're large ranches and they're you know run by businessmen who obviously want to make the most, most profit from um, having the fattest cows that they could sell um, to the nearest meat packer. And that replaced the romantic frontier cowboy. And of course the frontier cowboy was working for someone and they were under pressure to move the cattle as quickly as possible and as safely as possible um, to make as much money. <clears throat> and finally, just a few words on sort of violence in Texas at this time. Texas during this period of time became well known both in Texas and elsewhere for its violence and lawlessness. You have, of course, the vast majority of the people weren't criminals, but there were some who were very proud of the fact that they had killed 20 or 30 
people, you can read some of the details of this in the textbook. And one widespread uh, criminal activity was trying to steal other people's cattle. And you had people who would go up and rope a cow, even though it had a brand, and then they would have a branding iron, the criminals, and they'd take a, uh, a branding iron and put it on top of the other brand to try and change the other brand into the brand of the person they were working for. And they made a lot of money doing this. And there was a great effort made to develop brands, the symbols, that were hard to change. And one example is the XIX, which was one of the largest ranches in Texas. Because if you take a branding iron and you try and change that, what can you change it into? Not much. With just a, what they call a running iron, it's just a, a straight piece of metal. Now, if someone had a letter, two letters, and one of them was, for instance, F, well, you could take the F and, you know, put a vertical line on the right side of it and the F becomes an A. Or if someone has an I, well, all you do is put a horizontal line at the top, if you have space, and you make a T. So there was a real science to choosing the best brands. Some of them, sometimes they take the letters and put them on their side. And that's why today you can see ranches that are called like the rolling, the rolling P. Well, they took the P, the letter P, and they put it on its side in the brand. And then in combination with the other letters, it made it very, very difficult to brand. I was at a ranch a few years ago, a large ranch um, owned by someone I know. And they actually, you know, were showing me how they brand the cattle and all. <clears throat> and I was talking to, these are real life cowboys who still make their living doing this. And I was talking with them and they say, oh, yes, yes, sir, the cattle, uh, the, there's a still theft of cattle. What they do is they pull up at night uh, with a special tool. They cut your barbed wire and they come in um, and grab three or four cows and they put them on a truck and then they try and change the brands. And there are very, very serious penalties for that in Texas. And part of that is our heritage of, you know, cattle thieves are considered in Texas like the worst kind of criminals. Okay, that's the end of this lecture. In the next, so this is, we've been looking at Texas as the really stereotypical Western state, at least in our memories and imagination, where in essence it still remains a Southern state. Uh, we saw that both before and during the Civil War. And we'll see in the next lecture uh, the changes that took place in the southern part of the United States, including Texas. Thank you.